Start the game. And then duck. And then duck. Okay, that's a little ominous. <laughs> So, hope everybody's in the right session. This is module architectural development in Drupal 8. The thing, uh, the earlier version of this said web app development in D8. Uh, ba basically, we're going to be covering uh, Drupal Composer, custom entities, custom modules, uh, complex relationships, via plugins, and that sort of thing. So let's see. Let me make this big. Let's go back to play. All right. So, um, just kind of a want to get a grasp of the audience. Uh, how many here are module developers? I uh, guess that's a trade. Cool. Um, any? I'm just kind of curious. Any themers? Site builders? Okay. Cool. Yep. Yep. Those with multiple hats. Yeah. 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 All right, my name is Jimmy Jonathan. Um, I've been coding for nine years, been in Drupal for six and a half, seven years. I uh, love my wife and two kids, and I'm from LA, but I live in Chattanooga. I work for Code Journeyman, and uh, again, we're up in Chattanooga. We do web app development for Overgate National Labs is one of the bigger clients that we handle, but uh, we, we like to kind of focus in on problems that, that companies may have. Um, we're not really big on marketing or um, cat videos and pictures, websites. So um, we are also the host of uh, Drupal Camp Chattanooga, which is coming up in May. So definitely check that out, it's just up the up the way there. And today's agenda will be, like I said, covering Drupal Composer, custom entities, and the custom fill plugin. Um, how many are using Composer? Okay, to be more clear, how many are not using Composer? Have not used Composer at all. Okay, might be a little bit tough to follow if, if you have no familiar with Composer, but um, because I got to brush through this bit, I'm gonna be covering some, I guess, uh, configurations that Drupal, that Drupal Composer does to give us some tooling for later on down the line in today's session. Um, so Composer is a package dependency manager in PHP. And out of the box, it reaches out to a website called Packages, where you can require libraries to be used in your, um, in your project, whatever PHP project that might be. Uh, to do that, you just simply, in your composer.json file, say, I require this particular li library. Um, you could also separately require dev dependencies, where uh, that particular library or tool is not actually going to be uh, brought down to your production environment. So there's, there's a nice little separation of things there. Um, when you do use Composer, you'll run install or update, depending on what server you're, you're working on or your local environment. Install will um, create a lock file if it doesn't already have one. And, um, or it'll read the lock file and begin the process of making sure that your required libraries are downloaded and available to your project to use. Update, on the other hand, will actually update your lock file and pull down the latest and greatest up to whatever version you've indicated in your, um, in your composer.json. When this happens, um, your project directory which is different than your Drupal root or Drupal directory. Um, just out of the box, kind of not Drupal, just uh, uh, a bare bones project. You got your project directory, your composer.json, your composer.lock, and then in your vendor directory is where Composer kind of manages the file that it's going to bring down and make available to your project. Uh, it also provides auto loading, which is really nice if you're taking advantage of the namespacing and uh, the OOP. Uh, things out of the box um, that it, it brings to the table, it'll auto load all the <coughs> tools that you've now required for your project. Where does Drupal Composer come in? How does it kind of bring some tools and, and, and changes to Composer that allow me to take advantage of that for my Drupal project? When you run Composer Create Project, which is uh, 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 it reaches out to packages and 
and Drupal has uh, Drupal Composer has a um, a package out there that is a template for your Composer project. Um, this one in particular is Drupal Composer slash Drupal Project. So that's the actual project uh, that is pulling down, and we're specifying that's 8.x dev. Don't let the dev here throw you off. You're actually getting the stable version of Drupal 8, but it's dev right now for this particular project because they have not yet released a stable release. Fair enough? Everybody copy that? All right. So when you do that, you also want to specify your the project directory, basically, I'll just say project name. The stability is dev right now because they're still in dev, although, to be honest with you, it's great and you're only going to have it on your local box anyways, pretty much. Um, and and from no interaction, so it'll just, boom, download everything for, for the Drupal 8 project. Change directory in your project name, and right away, you can go composer require Drupal admin toolbar, uh, a contrib module everybody probably uses, if not, you should. Um, so there's some magic going on here because Drupal Admin Toolbar is not on packages. It's on d.o, drupal.org. So what's going on? Um, oh, and uh, when you run that command, by the way, it automatically enters the require uh, statement into your Drupal, or your closer.json, and, and there you go. Also, uh, it'll download, uh, download it. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right. so. What's the difference? What does Drupal Composer bring to the table? Well, all it is is a modification of the composer.json file. And these modifications are things you can do for any project that you have special requirements for. One of the first um, notable changes to the composer.json file is that it lists a special repository of type composer packages.drupal.org. So now your composer project knows and is aware that there's something in addition to packages out there. On Drupal.org, there's the contrib modules, the contrib themes, the contrib libraries available through d.o. So when you run the require, it knows about that repository and can reach out and grab those. Another few things that it comes with are CLI tools that, again, if you're not using Drush and you're not using Drupal console, you definitely need to jump on those. They're great tools bring a lot to the table, but you'll notice that right out of the box, the composer JSON that it came with uh, Drupal Composer has a number of requirements. I don't even include all of them here. And obviously one of those is uh, Drupal 8 is a requirement for your project, so it actually manages Drupal 8 as a requirement. But it also comes with uh, Drupal Console and Drush, like I said. Um, it also comes with a dev requirement, B hat. If you're not doing acceptance testing, again, jump on that, learn it. It's really nice to do a, uh, a task, a work order, and knock out the acceptance test side by side with it. And now you can just hit, you know, play on your uh, PHP storm, which runs B hat tests for you, and you can see everything is like good to go, and and move forward. And if you uh, want to get even better, uh, you can take it into um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, which everybody's doing, um, or should be doing. It's, it's the goal, right? Uh, so what I mentioned earlier about the project directory was that uh, there's a difference between your project root and Drupal root. So you got your project root, again, it's got your composer files, your vendor directory, but in the web directory, and I'm not including everything that's in project root, in the web directory is where Drupal root Drupal root lives in this particular composer, uh, Drupal uh, friendly composer template. So, uh, so keep that in mind because if you want to do, oh, I'll, I'm skipping a part. Well, yeah, here. If, keep that in mind because if you want to run Drush, you have to be in Drupal root, right? So, you got to make sure you change directory into the web folder, and from there, you can take advantage of the Drush that's project specific by doing dot dot vendor bin drush. Now, there's a tool out there that makes it so you don't have to do dot dot vendor bin drush every single time. You can just run drush. It's called drush launch. And I don't have this in the slides. I'll try to um, put that slide in here so that when I do upload it and it's available to you guys, uh, you'll, you'll have that. But drush launch gives you the, the ability for it to know, hey, there's a project specific drush. Let's use that. And if it doesn't find a project specific drush, it'll use your kind of global available drush if you have it. All right, and one last thing that it does is it also provides 
a, uh, a set of path configs so that when it asks google.org for a module, a contrib module, that's supposed to go in our contrib directory, right? It's not going to go in our vendor directory. We don't want it there. We want it in our contrib directory. So this is actually where that's that's configured. And here's our modules contrib and our themes contrib and the name of the module that's being grabbed. And here's a couple of uh, uh, metadata that tell this, like if it's a Drupal module, then it goes in modules contrib. Does that make sense? That was a follow. So that was a little bit of magic that I didn't know was actually happening. I was like, I'm glad this works, but I need to know what's kind of what's happening. How is this actually working? And so I, I thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, Composer merge. So custom modules can also have their own dependencies. Now, um, obviously, a custom module will, in most of our cases, live with that project. But there might be instances where you kind of have a instance of that module floating on multiple projects. Maybe you even have it uh, uh, existing in its own Git repository, the whole nine yards. And if you're doing that, uh, you'll want to take advantage of actually having the dependencies listed in your custom modules composer file. So it's got its own composer file. And um, so in order for this to work, you got to go to the project directory, run composer require, and for the project, you got to require Wikimedia's little plugin for composer. It's called composer merge plugin. And what this allows is for composer to look through uh, specified subdirectories for existing composer JSON files. But you've also got to tell it what directories it should look through. And of course, I'm going to specify web modules custom, and then any of my custom modules composer.json files. Um, now, this is different than this down here. This is the dependency listed in your info.yaml, right? So, how does that work? What are the um, major. Yeah, let me, I'll get to that. Sorry. Um, so, now, in my web modules custom, my custom module, I can actually run composer require state machine. It's an awesome contrib module if you've never used or seen it. It's used heavily by commerce, and I think supported heavily by commerce. Um, and then I get a no update flag, because I actually don't want a vendor directory sitting here. Um, so I say no update, don't create a lock file, don't create a vendor directory, don't actually pull it down here. I don't need it. It will then. Um, Let me see. You will then need to go into your uh, com uh, composer.json uh, actually before you run this and add a repository listening to packages.google.org. So you've got to have this in your uh, custom modules composer.json and then you can run this and uh, or type it in manual if you want. So what's going on here is um, this the composer.json is telling composer, I need these packages, these Drupal modules available to my system, to my uh, project, um, but it doesn't install them. It is your info.yaml file where you list it as a dependency that it actually tells Drupal this needs to be enabled. Okay, so when you enable this module, Drupal will now will see this, but it is composer that makes it available. Does that jive okay with everybody? Follow? Okay, good. All right, so what are we doing today? We actually be kind of working on a problem I came across not long ago uh, for a fitness app. And the idea here is that you've got a list of workouts, um, let's say hammer time or blazing saddle buns, and it has multiple exercises in each of those workouts, and those work exercises can exist across multiple workouts. So there's a bit of a complex uh, relationship there, as many and many. But you've also got the need now to uh, have a timer set on each exercise particular to the workout. Um, and so users can select a workout, play through the workout's exercises countdown timer, start, skip, uh, start, stop, skip exercises in a workout. Admins will need to be able to create exercises with a description and a video that maybe kind of loops through the exercise itself. So it creates workouts with exercises and 
specifies a time for each exercise in its specific workout. And what I'm trying to get here is not, you know, let's how do we build a fitness app. What I'm trying to get at is a structure. So I've got, you know, hammer time, blazing saddle buns, rocket abs. And inside of those, I've got a, a workout that could actually exist in any one of those three. And I got another workout that might only exist in two. So it's a many-to-many um, a -many relationship. Um, I've got a few questions that kind of I was chewing on as, as I was challenged with this. Um, do we note or build a custom content entity? Where do we field the relationship? On the exercise, on the workout, somewhere else? Um, oh, and where do we field the time? And that was the one that really got me hung up for a little while. So do we know or do we content entity? Now in, in D6, D7 days, it was um, a common phrase. It's like, no, everything is a note, note is everything, or something along the lines of, uh, if it's gonna be visible to an end user, um, that's probably a note, right? Um, but I never really, uh, and, and funny enough, on an earlier inter in, um, uh, iteration of this um, project, this concept, I actually did it as a content type. So I've got exercises down here, workouts down here, um, and so I was able to build those content types. But I got to thinking about, and w when would it be a good time to implement custom content entities? And what's the difference? Uh, and when do we choose it? Um, so a little run through of, of entities in Drupal 8. Um, you got two types of entities. You got configuration entities and content entities. A configuration entity basically handles the, the work of keeping configuration in the database and is not fieldable. Whereas a content entity, and these are really oversimplified, okay? A content entity, I'll just do it by example. You've got a node, a comment, a taxonomy term, maybe even a menu item. A user is a content entity in Drupal. Don't let that confuse you. Uh, it's different than content type or node, right? Those two are, are equivalent. Uh, a content entity is above node, and, and, and if you were to look at it as a hierarchy. So when should you go custom? You know, new content type or full-fledged content entity? Um, and some of the comments that I've read uh, from this guy uh, on a uh, Lullabot article, um, kind of, I like the way he broke it down. Nodes are for document-y kind of things, document-like things. You might consider custom when the thing you're dealing with is behavior-y, right? Um, a, a bookable room, maybe for a hotel or, or event. Um, units of inventory, like for products. Um, if nodes, a plethora of uh, out-of-the-box fields are a little bit of overkill for your thing, uh, in the title, body, the summary for the body, author, a multitude of settings for publishing and, and um, uh, the menu placement, the whole nine yards that come with Node, which is great, but it might not be a great fit for you know your thing. But all of that said, how much of that is used on 100% of your nodes, right? Um, every node doesn't become a, a thing in a menu item or at the top of a list or published to the front page, right? But those tools are available to nodes. So the argument could be made that, well, is a content entity really any different from a node if we're not using those things anyways on all of our nodes? So I get the argument both ways, and I, I would love to hear any comments at the end of this on this particular question. Um, yeah, I want to see that. <laughs> So the beautiful thing about uh, Drupal console is it's a command line tool um, that we can take advantage of. And we're going to go ahead and generate a module. And we're going to use that module to um, tell Drupal about our content entities. Um, so just to kind of walk through it real fast, uh, we better than Drupal with that Drupal command, generate module. And it will walk us through asking us a number of uh, kind of wizard questions about uh, the module code that it's going to just automatically generate for us. And this is a tool that's out there, you can use it. Um, and so I'll just give it a, a, a module name. Um, it'll automatically choose a machine name for me based off of the, the module name I gave it. It already, already uh, provides a, um, the correct module's custom path on where to place the module. 
I enter the description. It gives me a number of defaults for a few other questions. It will even add a composer JSON file and ask me if I want to add dependencies then, which I wouldn't recommend. I've gotten that working very well. Um, it'll even ask if you want to generate a unit test and themable template, which I've said no to on these, but uh, um, you know, depending on the needs of your project, that's it's good stuff to, to all have generated automatically for you ready to go. You don't have to go to an old project where you've developed a custom module and, all right, let me grab these three files because I use those, and now I've got to go into those files and change, you know, what I had to, to in order to generate a, uh, a custom module, right? This kind of does all of that work for you. Uh, so when that happens, it, it, grabs the, it, it, it creates three files for you in a fitness uh, directory inside your custom directory, um, and it will generate your info.yaml and your module dot module file with uh, some pre-configured uh, or pre, uh, pre-made help stuff. And now we can use that same tool with the given um, custom module we built to generate a content entity. So I can go vendor bish, ah, dot, dot vendor bin Drupal generate entity of type content. And the first question it asks me is, what module do you want to stuff this entity into? And so I tell it fitness. And I tell it, I'm going to call this the workout entity. And I'm going to uh, give it a machine name and a label. I'm also going to set the, uh, the default base path. And uh, do I want bundles? Now, bundles are what Node has out of the box. I don't, didn't see the need for bundles here. Didn't need to see the need to make it translatable or revisionable. Um, and there we go. There's a lot more code now in my fitness module, stuff that it just kind of auto-generated that's useful for the given thing that I'm going to create. Yeah? Did you investigate much about the, the whole bundles thing? I'm curious if there's some performance save or, because in the future, you now limited yourself to that, can you add the ability to make bundles later? Or I think you can. Like one to one, here's my bundle, here's my entity at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know um, I thought through that one. I thought about why, I guess, an exercise, for example, or a workout would need a bundleable version of workout. Maybe um, there are special types of workouts that are separate and distinct in very distinct ways that would have different fields from this type of workout to this type of workout. I didn't really see, and maybe I am limiting myself because I'm just not seeing far enough ahead. I don't know, though, whether or not you're limited on actually bringing that back into the, into the game later on? That, that's a good question. I think if it, existing content is there, maybe not. Yeah. That's, that's a good yeah. question. So, uh, so it generated a number of files, and some of the files that it generated are entity and form um, classes that Drupal will now use to build uh, your workout entity as uh, part of your structure uh, structure thing, and so now you've got the workout settings and workout list in which you can uh, manage fields, manage form display, and manage display. Um, you can add workouts, and this is a, a fieldable entity now in your system. Out of the box, an entity with, when it's generated like this, okay, it comes with a name and an authored by. Now I can, I can wipe both of those away and start completely from scratch, and I can designate base fields like this for my custom entity that I say are definitely going to be there every single time, and if a site builder so chooses, can later add more fields to it using the UI. Um, those decisions, of course, you know, are on, on a project by project basis. So now we come to question two, where do I feel the relationship? It's not really a parent-child relationship and you can't really decide, okay, well, I'll just go ahead and pop a relational field on the child. It's more of a many-to-many -many relationship, and I kind of went back and forth on, on what would be a, the best spot for this. Um, if I put in, um, I, what, I, uh, what I ended up thinking about was, well, if I'm creating a workout, I'm going to want to stuff exercises that already exist into that. So I felt like it would be a good fit in workout, but I think we would probably go the other direction. Um, and there's tools out there that actually make it available on both anyways. So that's, this is the killer question. Where do I specify the time? So exercise 
uh, exists, um, and it's got to be, it's got to have a different time on each exercise per workout. So 40 seconds on this guy, 30 seconds on this guy, 25 seconds on this guy. Well, what I didn't actually build was another workout over here where each of these are completely different per exercise. So this is a fieldable entity reference. So where do I specify the time? It's a bit, uh, a little challenging. Uh, maybe field collection. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, I can see that working because on the workout, I could have a uh, uh, unlimited field. So boom, boom, boom of entity references to my exercises. Okay, that works. And alongside that, the other field for the time specification, maybe uh, the integer for number of seconds and display that as uh, hours and seconds. Okay, there, there we go. I've got something as a, as a block that I can boom, boom, boom on, on, on my workout. Oh crap, Drupal 8 uh, paragraphs is likely to replace field collection for Drupal 8. Paragraphs. Oh, oh, and, and a key part of this, on its way to being de de deprecated. <laughs> uh, field collection is on its way to being deprecated. Um, I was like, paragraphs. That leaves a bad taste in my mouth. That doesn't sound like what this kind of thing is for. I mean, paragraphs is freaking great to replace the body field. It does that job very well. I just didn't feel comfortable making it what held my two fields together, the entity reference field and my time field. It didn't seem like a, a good thing. And here is where I discovered plugins. How Drupal allows you to build custom fields. And now a field, all right, let me get ahead of myself. What is a plugin? Let me not get ahead of myself. What is a plugin? I keep doing this, don't I? What is a plugin? Now, um, you hear plugins, you think, well, WordPress has plugins. I mean, we're not WordPress. Um, and, and in WordPress, a, a plugin is the equivalent of a Drupal module, right? It's, it's, it's there kind of the same thing. So Drupal 8 still has modules. Um, what, what then is a plugin? for us. Plugins are built and provided inside of a module. And in this particular case here, I've actually got a plugin of type field and actually provides three plugins itself. You've got field type, that's the field itself. That's telling Drupal, hey, this field is an integer um, and it's gonna be stored in the database as an integer. You have the field widget which is going to provide the um, admin with the, the, the form field, okay? That's what a widget is, the form field for this particular field type. Um, so it's an integer uh, time, so I probably want, as, as a form field, maybe to actually split that up into three separate um, text boxes, hours, minutes, and seconds, and then that widget will suck that in as an hours, minutes, second value, and maybe do some math and, and spit it into the database as an integer, the number of seconds, okay? So that's kind of what field widget is across the board. If you're gonna build a field widget, it's what you're presenting to the user to, to actually uh, add a value to that, that form field. And then formatter will take that integer out and display it to the user. So I don't wanna display the number of seconds, so it will be smart enough to probably pull it out of the uh, database as, a, as an, an integer and the number of seconds, and then display it in hours, minutes, seconds. So these are three types of plugins that you can work with to have custom, field, uh, custom fields. Um, there are plugins for image uh, manipulation. Um, a lot of things in Drupal are plugins, and the beautiful, beautiful thing about object-oriented programming and that we have that is we can now take those as parents, those plugins as parents, those fields, those image manipulators, and um, adopt all of my parents' properties and methods, and even override some of them to do some really neat things. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and use Drupal. Uh, first off, I wanted to actually kind of show you the list of available plugins just through the Drupal console. Um, so I, what I did is I listed it out, and I grep for generate plugin because there's a generate of a bunch of things. 
And here's a number of the field. Uh, field, you can specifically actually uh, generate a field format or a field type or a field widget on their own. Or if you do field, it'll actually do all three for you. Um, here's another example, an image formatter, image effect. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot uh, going on with plugins in Drupal. So I went ahead and did a generate plugin field. And again, it just kind of ran through the wizard and started asking me, what's the first question? What module do we want to put this into? Um, what do we want to name this uh, field type? Um, and so I gave it entity relationship field with time. I then um, uh, entered some machine names uh, and a description. I specify the widget class name and the formatter class name. I uh, uh, related it to the field that we're creating, field type, and uh, um, ensured that the default formatter and the default widget were set. And do you want to, do you want to uh, uh, confirm, generate all of this? And I say yes. And again, boom, it just gives me uh, all this ready to go in my plugin folder. <laughs> all right. So now before we, st we start messing around, with our custom plugin, I need to take advantage of something out there already that does what I was describing earlier about um, hours, minutes, seconds, both the widget to enter it and the formatter to display it, um, and the field type itself to store it. And that was uh, a contrib module called HMS field, hours, minutes, second field. Uh, beautiful freaking little uh, tight, small uh, 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 contrib model out there. But in order to do this, remember what I showed you earlier about being able to have uh, dependencies listed in your custom modules composer.file. So in my custom modules composer.json uh, file, uh, I'm listing, again, drupal.org's package, package uh, repository, and then I'm listing this as a requirement for this uh, custom module. I can now go to my project directory and run composer update, specify the HMS field so that it goes ahead and does the work of grabbing the files and making it available in my, in my uh, contrib modules directory. You guys catch all that? So this isn't going into some folder inside my module. This is actually going to the proper place because it's a dependency within my Drupal project of a custom module, so it's going to go to, and it's a, but it's a contrib module, so it is going to go to the proper place in the contrib module folder. Everybody follow? Do you, so when you do the composer update, you have to fill it to the Drupal HMS field? No, you do not, but I do recommend if you are going to run update, you do specify that so that you can commit smaller chunks and run tests against each chunk. Each chunk. It will look to update every single package. Yeah. Yeah. So. What if you want to use the HMS field in multiple uh, custom modules? Well, it's listed as a dependency in this module, and that's it. That's it. Okay. That's it. So yeah, you can list it as a dependency in other modules, and then they're enabled. Um, or when you run a Composer install, uh, it'll grab the, fi the files. And it'll know it's already there, so it won't need to grab it again if you've oh. got two of them listed. And then each. Uh, whichever one gets hit first as far as the info.yaml by Drupal, it'll know, oh, this needs to be installed, right? Um, so here it is, yeah. If I list my uh, directories here, I've got web modules and trip, which is must field, is now in there. <coughs> and again, I need to go ahead and list it in my info.yaml as a dependency for Drupal to be aware of when this module is enabled. All right, so what do we get out of the box? I just generated a Crap ton of stuff. Well, some of the stuff we saw already that it provides functionality menus for us to click around and, and create and work with the entity, workout entity that we created. But this now specifically just generated us a plugin and a field type. So we need to go in there and customize it to our heart's desire for the specific kind of field we want to have. And in my case, I saw the opportunity to take advantage of, of something that already existed the entity reference field, right? So
So entity reference does the job of having a, uh, of a creating a relationship between two entities. It uh, does the job of providing a really nice widget, auto, auto complete widget, right? So that when I start typing jumping jacks, J U M, oh there it is, quick. So auto complete is a widget that comes with entity ref field. So I like all of that. I want to keep all that. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the entity reference item. And in doing so, I now have, I can get rid of all the code that this came with, and, I, and I'll show that, because what I ended up needing to do was the only two changes I needed to make was to override these two uh, methods. And when I override them, what I wanted to do was reach up to my parent, the entity reference, grab it, and then pass it on. But when I grab it, I wanted to manipulate it. I wanted to add something else to it, special. And that's what this is in, in object-oriented programming. I'm, I'm actually grabbing the parent, running the same thing, and then passing that along. And so much, something I'm going to do here in the middle is going to manipulate that and add my time field, uh, my time property. And so here I'm actually uh, defining um, that it's an integer as a label of time. And I'm then telling the schema what the column name is as a type integer and only a length of 11. I do the same thing with the widget plugin. I swap it around and take advantage of autocomplete. Another bit of badassery that comes with the entity reference module, right? So again, I take the parent, I say I need to do something special, I kick it on. And what do I do? I add the, the time element and I take advantage of my dependency, HMS. That's the type of field I get to use because I'm, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the dependency, the uh, contrib module, um, and giving it a label actually as specified in the data definition from the field type uh, plugin. So that's cool, I pass that on there. And then I do the same thing for the formatter, the way it's displayed. I grab the parent, I shuffle it around, and then pass it on. And what is it that I'm shuffling around? Well, um, you know, this formatter um, only has one thing to deal with. So it's, a, uh, it's a, a render array, and it only has one object in the render array. And that is, in this case, the, uh, the exercise, right? So it's going to display that exercise. But in my case, when I grab from the parent, I've got the exercise in hand. I need to set that aside and then create an array. And that array is going to be a render array now, but it's only going to have, it's going to have two things instead of the one object. It's going to have two things in the array, the time, and now I'm going to take that exercise and plop that back in, pass that whole array on. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm taking it. I got the exercise object. I'm going to set that aside for a second, create an array of two things, time, field, or the, the time value, and the exercise thing, pop that in there, and pass it on. <laughs> so, with that, um, I have now got, uh, when I go to add um, a field, uh, I manage fields in my workout. Um, and I'm adding a field, I've got entity relationship field with time, but it also realizes that this applies to other entities. Now, I've got taxonomy term, and I taxonomy term with time field. I've got user with time field. I've got content type with time field. And these are all the reference uh, options that are available now because I've built this plugin. So I'm going to go ahead and label this exercises. I'm going to set it to unlimited. And the type of entity that I'm going to reference is the exercise entity. You didn't see me create that, but it was the exact same thing as a workout entity. Exact same thing. Yeah. So when you created the plugin, any reference of no type it wasn't limited to anything specific? Right. Yeah. Because this is just a field type now that exists that's only taking, that's taking advantage of reference. And, and so it becomes a reference type field. And so anywhere that's being used, taxonomies, users, etc. It's now available. All right, so I've added the field, and here we go. 
Um, I can uh, make uh, changes to the label, add some help text, add exercises to this workout, each with their respective countdown time length. And look at that. Here's some examples that show up when I uh, look at the default value. So let's actually go see what that really looks like. So I created a couple of exercises. As I said, I created the exercise entity. And there it is. Blazing Saddle Buns is going to be the workout I create. I'll divide, I left that in there. And here's the first exercise. I start to type jumping jacks. I click on jumping jacks. It grabs it. I also enter 30 minutes. Oops. That wasn't supposed to be 30 minutes. That was supposed to be 30 seconds. And then 20, uh, 20 minutes for burpees. It's a long freaking workout. <laughs> Anybody want to try it? <laughs> But yeah, now, and now I've got this available in my system. It's a fieldable entity reference. And, and so a little bit of a complex uh, relational thing going on there. So this is, this is the workout, plays and seven runs. And here's the two entries. And your themers can take that and do as you wish with it. So in summary, a few things we picked up on. Drupal Composer uh, gives you a few things out of the box. Drupal root is in the web directory. There's actually another. Uh, Composer and Drupal thing out there. I think Acme put it out that uses doc root instead of web. Uh, so just be aware that you might see that out there. Um, and then there's another one that actually doesn't have a uh, subdirectory for doc root for for Drupal uh, for Drupal root. Um, so just be aware that those examples exist. Also note that your your uh, project specific CLI tools are in vendor bin and. Um, it, it sets up and configures composer.json um, for Drupal specific uh, uh, things you need. Composer Merge is a plugin for Composer that gives you the ability to read subdirectory Composer JSON files um, so you can require dependencies from your custom module and list those dependencies in your, uh, and, and remember that it, it's the two separate things. The composer.json lists the requirement and your info.yaml list the dependency so that it's enabled. And uh, Drupal console is awesome. Uh, again, a thing I want to iterate. Um, it, you can generate entities, plugins, and a whole lot more. And plugins are a thing in Drupal that, uh, just like entities, it's one of those things you kind of had to wrap your head around, get used to, and learn. Um, so if, if there was a, a tiered uh, level of knowledge, you learn about content types. That's the first thing you learn about. Then you kind of learn views, right? From there, you learn entities and maybe get into uh, plugins. And uh, wrapping your head around that is going to give you power uh, when it comes to building custom modules in the future. So, um, yeah. Questions? Did I, did I go through that pretty fast? I, yeah. No, it's good. Yeah, but it's okay. Go for it, man. Is the slideshow available on the I will make it available today. I'm going to add, uh, what was that portion that I said I was going to add? <laughs> I remember where I said it. I don't know what slide I said it. Oh, yeah. oh uh, Drush Launch. Yeah, I was going to add Drush Launch. Do you know where the slides are going to be available? Um, I will add them to the um, Florida Drupal Camp um, for this session. It's the easiest way to find it. And you said this was not out to where's the front end for it? Like, did you actually do this or is this something? Nope. It was a it was a uh, situation I saw my wife's company was uh, dealing with. Their app team took six months to deliver something that was total shit. Didn't didn't have any of these uh, requirements, and it was listed requirements. And I was like, I don't think that's going to be that hard. Like, what? So I went through the process of thinking this through, and I, I was like, wow, this is a great discovery. I want to share this. Uh, got it to the local Drupal user group and thought I'd, I'd polish it up and share it with you guys. James, I was just wondering what the what does a data model end up looking like from a database perspective when you're creating plugins. So I fully understand, you know, you have an entity even if you bundle like fields have their own tables. Plugins then have their table which okay. connect remember, entities. That have remember that this is a field, right? Right. A plugin is the code, it's the OOP that actually generates that field. Okay. So just like any other field, it's got its own table, um, and then so it can field. be related to uh, through, through. And it just acts as an intermediary, uh, like middleman, like we were talking about, mm -hmm. between entity X and Y. Yeah. Will this have two tables, or one table with two columns? So this would actually have three. two 
tables because it would add, well, hold on. Let's see. Entities. No, because I've got entity reference field, which already exists, and I'm taking advantage of that. So it wouldn't generate a new field for entity reference. It would just take advantage of the existing entity reference field. Every entity reference uh, creates a new table based on the base field name that you give it. So if you had three entity reference fields, but with different base field names, then you'd have three tables. And that's just the data tables. Of course, there are revision tables. That's separate. Yeah. We also have a look, but yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, see, I don't, I want to see, kind of, it's just a visual example of how that actually got put into the database. You know, just go look through those tables. If you want, we can. Yeah. After this, dig in my database. Anybody else? You had a question, right? Yeah. Uh, if you wouldn't create the special call today, could you create the plugin just for load? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, at the very beginning, when I showed you that I did originally create this as uh, content types somewhere at the beginning. Um, I, I listed that exercises and workouts uh, were there, and in there, uh, so yeah, it's it's just a field. So yeah, you can add it to anything that is a fieldable entity in Drupal. Are, are there any performance differences between for this specific case? No. You would use node or your own entity? Not not really. I mean, the entity would be faster. Uh, okay, so there's there's some debate about whether um, you might get speed performance uh, um, bumps by actually going custom entity, right? But um, it's a bit of an architectural question, and and, and it's a, on a per case basis. Um, honestly, the most often that I see uh, custom entities being used is for contrib modules. Um, rarely, I, I, at least in my experience, have I seen. The need to actually build a, a custom entity, a content entity for for a project. The registration RNG module using uh, event type uh, mm -hmm. registering type and something else. Yep. So then those and can they're be very very form. base fields. Like they're yeah. like they're empty. They've got like one two fields of that, right? When when you create that plugin with all the code, where do you look at what what to base your information from? Okay, so you're asking me how did I learn this? <laughs> no, um, no, because any plugin you're gonna create, uh -huh. you will base on the HMN. So you, you take something and you improve it. Uh, oh so yeah. you gotta take advantage of the structure of what you start with. So I was thinking, where do you see the, the information of the structure? Just enter the module? Well, this early in the game on D8, a lot of the uh, documentation isn't there. So I, for HMS field, I, I discovered HMS field. I was like, I would like to take advantage of that. And there was no documentation for this particular way of working with it. There was documentation on how to add it to a uh, content type um, and, and use the field. But I wanted to go in on the code and take advantage of it in a plugin, a custom, uh, custom plugin, and, and create a custom field with it. Add it, actually add that field type that it provided to my thing. So um, I didn't know how to do that. I kind of had to go into their code and, and, and look for other examples of how people, uh, I, I knew I knew that it was a field type, I just didn't know that it was called HMS, and I forget how I discovered that. It's just like OOP principles, right? Yeah. And you yeah. can extend other classes or whatever, so if you know that. And I knew that it being a field, it must be a field type. Um, so there, there must be a field type of it. I just needed to know the machine name for that field type. Actually, come to think of it now, I, I probably could have found it a lot easier uh, thinking about it. Now that I know field type, widget, formatter, and I know it's a field type that I want to take advantage of, I probably just all I had to do was go into the code and look for the, the field type plugin for that contrib module and look at the machine name that it finds. And that probably would be it. Anything else? I know I talked really fast, but I, I felt like I had a lot of information. Every time I practiced this, I was on a 50 minute mark every single time. So. You did good. <laughs> you did good. All right. And uh, the video uh, will be up uh, at some point, so if you need to re review this, go for it.